Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining. I hope you're all able to enjoy some of the beautiful weather this past weekend. Guests are welcome. For your convenience, you'll all receive a recording of the presentation and all of the slides later this afternoon. My name is Melissa Johnson and I'm an insurance principal within our Troy office. I also co-chair the manufacturing and commercial industry groups for the firm. Raymond is committed to assisting our manufacturing clients navigate the challenges created by the current economic uncertainty and COVID-19. And with that, thank you very much to Jessica Dory and Brian Young for joining us today to discuss IT security and continuity planning. Both Jessica and Brian work within our technology solutions group and have extensive experience working within the manufacturing sector. Thanks, Melissa. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, I, on behalf of myself and Brian, we're really excited to share this topic with you. Um, we're very passionate about it. I spend my time um, helping our clients from a proactive perspective um, by performing security assessments, vulnerability penetration testing. What we really want to do is make sure that organizations are being proactive in their IT security measures and also in their continuity planning. Um, Brian, you want to go ahead and give a little bit of your background? Sure, Jessica. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Just want to echo the comments. Hope everyone had a great Memorial weekend. It was beautiful out there. Thanks for joining us bright and early for the uh, third um, uh, third part of the uh, webinar series we've had uh, based on the manufacturers out there getting back to work. So looking forward to it. As Jessica said, passionate about this topic. I've been with uh, RTS um, in the IT technology group for, well, 17 years, been in IT overall for 25. Again, working proactively with clients, like Jessica said, trying to keep, uh, keep things um, on the IT side steady and uh, the ship above board so you folks can do what you do best. So looking forward to today's topic. Thanks for joining it again. Back to you, Jessica. Thanks, Brian. Um, so we're gonna go through our slides here. If you guys do have any questions at all, you can use um, the question uh, Q&A section to be able to submit those. Um, and we will um, have some time at the end for questions as well too. So we'll go ahead and get started. So why we're here. Um, remote workers normally make up about 3.2% of our entire workforce and 44% of companies don't actually allow remote work at all. Um, obviously in today's world um, with the COVID-19 scenario, um, that has changed significantly. Um, we have seen a significant shift uh, to a remote workforce. Um, with that said, our firm at Raymond, we have um, pretty much entirely shifted uh, to a remote workforce. Um, many organizations, what we found, weren't prepared for this remote uh, workforce shift in such a short time frame. We've also seen that while making this shift to the remote workforce, um, there's been many uh, security uh, items that have gotten um, missed when making that shift to the remote workforce. So why we're here today is really to talk about the shift to the remote workforce, what security measures you need to make sure that you have in place, and essentially um, you know, how you're gonna continue to um, work in this new environment that we're all living in today. So objectives of today, try to have some fun with this. We, we try, to keep it, try to keep it light and uh, enjoyable. Um, we're gonna review relevant cybersecurity and business continuity concepts. We're also gonna share uh, scenarios and examples of what can and did happen. We work in this on a daily basis, so we see a lot of um, incidents that happen and also um, you know, attacks that happen. So we're gonna share those with you as we go along. And then we're gonna have action items that will hopefully empower you um, to take back to your organization um, to continue to move uh, your security and continuity efforts forward. So the new normal, security is not convenient. Um, I absolutely 100% agree with this. Um, I know that most people agree with this because it is not convenient. Um, having strong, long, complex passwords that you have to change on a regular basis is not convenient. Nobody likes to do that. Um, you know, having security controls in place such as multi-factor authentication where you have to, you know, enter another set, um, you know, of having another, whether it's a, a text to your phone or, a, you know, having a token or things like that from a multi-factor authentication 
it's not convenient. Um, you know, all of these additional hurdles that we have to jump through, um, you know, to get authenticated to systems or, um, you know, have, you know, configuration setups and things like that. It's not convenient, but it is absolutely necessary as we continue to try to fight off these hackers that are out there. Um, so as we go through this, we're going to keep this in mind um, that yes, um, you know, some of these things that we talk about are not going to be convenient um, to implement and are not convenient for your users, but they are controls that are going to help protect your business. Um, another thing from a new normal perspective, IT security and continuity planning is not an IT thing. It is a business risk discussion. Um, a lot of organizations tend to push security and continuity planning on the information technology department. It is 100% not an IT issue, but really a business risk issue that the business as a whole needs to address and needs to understand. Um, you know, this comes in uh, perspective, both from a continuity perspective and also security, because again, it's your business risks that you're willing to take. So that has to come from the top down to understand what risks are we willing to take and what risks do we want to mitigate. So the costs are real, everyone. Um, $26.5 billion in lost revenue. Um, you know, that, that is a huge amount. And that comes from downtime costs for businesses. Um, when you look at it and you go to the average to small to mid-sized businesses, those average about $42,000 for each hour of downtime um, that an organization uh, experiences. And then when you even take it further down, it could, be, it could cost about $5,600 per minute that an organization is down. And so, um, you know, when we think about manufacturing, think about if your uh, company was to get hit with a ransomware attack and it took down your operations, think about how much that's going to cost you um, for every minute, every hour, every day that you have to halt production because your systems are overtaken by hackers. Or from a continuity perspective, if you were to have a disaster or thing, things along those lines, you know, that's, you know, when you look at a cost perspective, um, that is a large number um, and a large amount of money that is being lost. So, um, unfortunate reality, um, Robert Mueller, FBI director from 2001 to 2013 said there's only two types of companies, those that have been hacked and those that will be hacked. Um, as we continue to see threats rise, um, this just hits home for so many. Um, we see so many organizations that are being attacked from a ransomware perspective, from pure, um, you know, phishing and business email compromised, um, you know, those types of things. It is really, um, you know, uh, things that you all have to be prepared for. And it's not a matter of if, but a matter of when. So what we're going to talk about today is really going through these items that you should have in place um, to make sure that you are doing the things to proactively protect your organization. This gives a, um, screen a, a, a shot of the data breach history. Um, this comes from the ID Theft Resource Center. Um, do keep in mind that these numbers are reported um, ID theft and breaches that have happened. So um, know that a lot of breaches that happen out there don't even get reported. So this is the amount um, that was reported. So the first number that is shown, um, you know, if you look at the business um, line item there for where manufacturing would fall in. So the first number, 644, that was the total number of breaches that occurred that were reported in 2019. 43.7% is the total, the percentage of the total amount that that represents. The number underneath is the amount of records that were compromised. So over 18 million records compromised from a business perspective um, in 2019. So as you can see, these numbers are very staggering. Um, we continue to see large amounts of breaches occur every year 
which in turn affects large amounts of individuals from an ID theft perspective. So um, this will carry forward as we go through this and talk about um, you know, the breaches and how things happen and everything like that. But know that you know, these numbers, um, you know, we just continue to see large amounts of breaches that happen out there um, and data that is compromised. So have you seen the headlines? Um, I feel like every day there's a different breach that um, is reported out there. Um, these are some of the bigger ones that happened um, between the 2018 and 19 timeframe. Um, you know, we constantly are seeing ransomware attacks, um, data breaches, uh, you know, full compromises of systems, you know, those types of things. Um, you know, these are, these are happening every single day. Um, and like I said, you know, some breaches that happen never even make the news because of the size, you know, they, they weren't of that size to make it. And then we do see, you know, these on a regular basis, um, you know, in the news. So it's almost gotten to the point where some people feel um, somewhat numb to the fact that, you know, these are happening because they are happening at such a rapid rate. Um, but I can tell you um, in dealing with these breaches that happen, um, it, is, it is extremely disruptive um, to businesses that this happens to. Um, and it takes a large amount of resources and a large amount of money um, to be able to recover from attacks like this that happen. So cybercrime on the dark web. I'll pull this up here. Um, so ransomware attacks costs nearly tripled in 2019 to over 36,000 per attack. Um, I can tell you we experience, uh, we have a team that handles incident response here at the firm. And we have seen a number of ransomware attacks just happen here in the beginning of the year. So we've already um, helped four organizations um, already this year in 2020 um, recover from ransomware attacks. And I can tell you that the cost of over 36,000 um, is, is low compared to what we've seen that has happened. Um, we just recently helped an organization um, recover from a ransomware attack. Um, that organization um, is going to spend upwards of hundreds of thousands of dollars trying to recover from this attack. Um, and it has brought their business to a halt for all, almost three weeks. Um, so think about that um, from your business perspective. Uh, this most recent uh, ransomware attack uh, is believed to have come in through a phishing type email um, where it got into the organization and um, spread throughout the organization. And when you look back at if they would have taken some proactive measures um, and proactive steps to protect their environment, um, this attack would not have been nearly as costly for them. Um, and it would have saved them um, you know, a lot of time, a lot of resources, a lot of money. Um, so you know, with this, it's, ransomware is a big uh, disruption for any organization. Um, and it's something you want to make sure that we have the proactive measures in place that we're gonna be talking about as we go through this presentation um, to keep those attackers at bay. So why do they do it? Um, money is the biggest driving factor for the hackers that's out there. Um, it, it, you know, it's really that financial motivation. Um, they want to be able to get into an organization and they want to, from a ransomware perspective, hold your um, systems hostage or from a business email compromise, they want to potentially get you to send money um, to them some way, um, or they want to essentially take over, uh, you know, wire systems that you have to, or banking systems that you have that where you can transfer money out of your organization. So um, primarily money is their driving factor. Um, they also, you know, some do it for thrills, idealism, state-sponsored or hacktivism, but overall um, financial is definitely the biggest motivator for these hackers. So who's behind these breaches? This data came from the Verizon 2020 data breach investigations report that was recently released. 70% um, of the breaches that they studied during this uh, 
investigation report that they did were perpetrated by external actors. 55% of those were carried out by organized criminal groups. 30% involved internal actors. 4% had four or more actor actions that occurred. 1% involved partners and 1% fe featured multiple parties. So some of the commonalities between the breaches that were um, investigated in this report, hacking accounted for 45% of those breaches. 37% of the breaches stole or used credentials. 86% of breaches were financially motivated. So just going back to what we just talked about, 86% um, of those breaches were financially motivated. So they are after, um, they're trying to financially benefit from um, the actions that they are taking. 27% of malware incidents were ransomware. So a large portion of the malware incidents that are out there are ransomware. 28% um, of breaches involve small business victims. We're gonna talk more about that here in these upcoming slides, um, but small businesses are a very large target for hackers that are out there. So why are small businesses prime targets? Budget, small to mid-sized Businesses spend 10% of their annual budget on IT, including support. They can't afford things like a $40,000 firewall or having a, a, a CISO on staff, a chief information security officer on staff. They have low IT skill level or no support unless something breaks. Aging equipment and unpatched devices, I can tell you when we go into organizations and, and do our assessments and do our testing, we find so many uh, devices that are no longer supported um, by the vendor um, and are also not patched. We see significant amounts of um, patches behind. By not applying patches, you are leaving that vulnerability um, that that hacker knows is there um, a prime target for them. Um, because if you leave it unpatched, it's a way that they can get into your systems um, so making sure you're keeping your systems patched and up to date is very critical. Um, owners in small to mid-sized businesses wear many hats and um, don't focus purely on security or don't know security that well. Small to mid-sized businesses don't believe it's going to happen to them. Um, as um, I've been working with the firm for 15 years and throughout um, those 15 years, I've heard so many times, well, why would a hacker, you know, want to target you know, my, my small business. Um, they're they're going to target it because it's low-hanging fruit for them um, because they know all of these things um, that we just talked about, not having the budget, not having the skilled people, um, you know, those types of things. So that is why small businesses, small to mid-sized businesses are prime targets for them. Um, they believe that their data is not valuable. Um, so they think again, you know, again, what would what would the hacker want with my small business and the data that we have? Um, almost all organizations store some type of sensitive information. Um, so that sensitive information to those hackers out there is extremely valuable. And if they can get that information, um, you know, by compromising, you know, a small business that doesn't have um, the proper security controls in place. Um, you know, that's going to be beneficial to them and they can sell that um, sensitive data that's out there on the black market. Um, small, uh, small to mid-sized businesses are far behind enterprise in educating employees. Um, met, we're going to talk about this as we continue to go forward, but, you know, many times the way a hacker gets into an organization is by exploiting employees, by getting them to click on a link or open an attachment um, that they send in their email. Um, you can see over here on the left of the slide, um, malicious emails per user by organization size. When hackers are targeting organizations from a phishing uh, perspective, they are targeting um, those small organizations at a percentage rate that is very um, comparable you know, to, you know, the, the percentage rate is very large in the small businesses when you compare it to the larger businesses. But when you think about a small business with one to 250 employees getting six users targeted, and then an organization with over 2,500 people 
only getting 11 users targeted, those small to mid-sized businesses are likely, someone in that organization is likely to click on one of those uh, emails that is coming. And when you don't have that proper education for those employees about what they should be doing and what they shouldn't be clicking on and everything like that, it's mm -hmm. going to make it much more likely um, that that small business is going to get compromised uh, because that training is not there. Mm -hmm. Brian, I know you had a couple comments here. Yeah, thanks, Jessica. Um, for, for everyone out there, th this is a, a real powerful slide that I, I just want to make sure everyone lets it sink in. Out of everything we've talked about so far, uh, I'll just reiterate what Jessica said. In, in our field experiences, we deal with um, clients and, and folks in this sector. This, this, this particular slide is probably the number one thing that we deal with in that small and medium space. You know, the one user up to 500, and, and most of the conversation is focused around why us? No one cares about us or our data. And, and everyone needs to understand, as Jessica just pointed out, uh, first off, a lot of times, it, it's not a matter of them focusing on you. A lot of this is automated. They just realize that uh, through an automated attack that they can find more open doors or vulnerabilities in a smaller business than the larger ones do. So please take stock of this. It's important to understand that it's not the fact that somebody's out there in their basement focusing on your small business. It's done through the internet. It's done through a large phishing and email deployments. And it's not specifically focused on you, but you are, you are the easiest target. And once they get access, it's really about holding you hostage. It's about your data and then how much can they get out of you to get your data back so that you can maintain uh, business or stay in business. And along with um, the employee part, the biggest return on investment we'll talk about or the easiest return on investment is, is really about employee education. Uh, as more than ever, especially in the SMB space. So anybody in that one to 500 seat range or user range, um, this is important stuff. So thanks, Jessica. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks, Brian. Okay. So specifically looking at the manufacturing industry, um, this comes from the data, uh, the 2020 Verizon data breach uh, study. So this is specifically looking here and taking into consideration those uh, breaches that were analyzed. Um, manufacturing, um, biggest way, um, biggest uh, incidents that are happening are coming from crimeware. So crimeware is essentially um, all the different types of malware that don't fall into any of these other buckets that are um, included here in this graph. Um, so that could be, you know, um, password uh, dumping malware, um, you know, things like that. Um, it could, you know, obviously phishing emails, things, uh, you know, all of that would fall in there. So, um, you know, overall um, in this uh, report, there were 922 incidents um, with 381 confirmed data disclosures. Um, like I said, crimeware really topped, um, you know, the, from a way that they're attacking perspective. Um, that's how they're attacking the manufacturing industry. Threat actors, external by far. So 75% of those, um, you know, were external uh, entries trying to get into organizations. Motivators, again, financial, huge, 73% um, from a financial uh, motiva motivation perspective. Espionage as well, too. That was a, um, you know, a high number, especially from the manufacturing industry. So that is essentially, you know, them trying to get, um, you know, secrets and, and um, you know, different uh, sensitive uh, information, ways about doing things, ways about manufacturing things, um, you know, all of that. So that does um, is a, an increased focused um, fo or attack on the manufacturing side. Um, you know, credentials. So, uh, we talk about uh, credentials and that's uh, data compromise. So 55% of those, um, as we continue to move forward with this presentation, we'll talk about credentials and how very important it is to make sure that you have um, strong, complex passwords um, because so many credentials can be easily uh, guessed and stolen. So, so threat vectors, how are these bad guys getting in? Um, this from a high level perspective, you know, outlines um, the ways that they're getting in phishing, web and ransomware. I would say in all of our work by far, uh, you know, this leads the pack in 
um, you know, how those uh, bad guys are getting into organizations. Um, we get constant uh, calls, uh, you know, with phishing. Okay, my user clicked on this. Now I've got this in my environment. What do I do? Um, you know, all of those types of things. So this by far is, um, you know, one of the, the biggest attack um, vectors that we're seeing. Compromised credentials. So I just brought this up. Um, during our testing, what we do is we essentially um, try to utilize commonly used passwords to see if we can get into accounts at organizations. Um, it is by far uh, the fact that people use insecure passwords, um, you know, so many times we're able to essentially just guess those passwords and then we're able to get into organization systems, um, whether that's through email, um, you know, or, you know, getting in through, you know, other potential um, remote access ports that they have open. Um, but this, you know, compromised credentials is very important. And especially now um, in today's remote uh, workforce, we need to make sure that people are using strong, complex passwords um, because it is very easy to compromise those. And then tying that into the next one, weak passwords, many times weak passwords are how essentially those uh, credentials do get compromised. Um, trust relationships and propagation, poor encryption, um, again, from a remote workforce perspective, we need to make sure we have the proper encryption mechanisms in place. So that's very important. Um, unpatched vulnerabilities, like I talked about, if you're not patching your systems, you're leaving wide open holes for those hackers to be able to get into. Misconfigurations, um, just a very small misconfiguration on any device you have, um, you know, or any of your systems can leave a hole for a hacker. So that's why it's very important that you do have your devices configured and also reviewed by people um, who are experts in this. Because like I said, any small misconfiguration can leave a big hole for a hacker to get in. Malicious insiders is also another um, way that uh, bad guys get in. So there are malicious insiders out there that um, you know do go to organizations just for the peer act of um, being able to assist with a breach. Zero day and unknown um, methods as well too. So zero day vulnerabilities, those are still, you know, obviously um, a huge threat for organizations. Um, so again, you know, when we talk about all of this, you know, making sure that you have as many proactive controls in place. And we're going to start talking about that as we go through here. So this I always love to bring up, and it's always uh, much more impactful when you're in person and you can see everybody's faces. Um, because many times when I bring up this slide, um, just faces turn white because they see their password up here. Um, I will tell, this is uh, the most commonly used passwords, and this data comes from uh, when there are breaches that happen, uh, data is collected and information is collected and, and the breaches are looked at and you understand, okay, you know, how did, you know, how did this breach happen? Like I said, many of these breaches come from people using insecure passwords and credentials getting compromised. Um, so this is the top 10 most commonly used passwords in 2019. Um, I can say if you, if you are, if anybody out there is using any of these passwords, whether it be work or personal, please absolutely change your passwords. Some of the other very common ones we see are using the seasons. So say spring 2020 or summer coming up here soon, 2020. Um, we, like I said, during our testing are very frequently able to just purely guess uh, people's passwords because people are using passwords such as these or such as the ones I just, just described. So um, like I said, you know, make sure that you have you know, long, strong, complex passwords. Um, utilizing pass phrases um, is a good way to, ha to have those long, complex passwords. Um, you know, the longer you can get your password, the better. Um, you know, using a phrase, you know, keeps, you, keeps it away from the dictionary words. Um, password cracking tools um, utilize dictionary words. So if you can stay away from utilizing any dictionary words, um, that's going to make your password um, much more uh, 
much more difficult for a hacker to compromise. All right, so the business opportunity for them, anyway, um, is the uh, cost to launch an attack. So cost of malware out there, you can get for about $45 on the internet. Um, tutorial on how to attack, $5 for a basic attack. Zero day exploit kit costs about 1000 Full phishing kit costs about $500 or $30 a month. So when you look at it from that hacker spend perspective, you're looking anywhere roughly, you know, depending on what level they take it, um, from $550 to $1,000. Um, when you look at the uh, yield that this type of activity ranges, it ranges anywhere from $1,000 to $25,000. So they're getting a pretty, pretty good return on their investment. Um, and again, this all can be done by just essentially going out to the internet and, and buying these things. So, um, you know, they, that's why these hackers continue to do this because that financial motivating driving factor, and it is um, very successful for them. So employees are the weakest link. Um, I will tell you in all of our work that we have done, um, the employees definitely are the majority of the time the way that these hackers are getting in. Um, they're the leading cause of data breaches, negligent insiders. Clicking on links or malicious attachments and emails is by far probably the most uh, common uh, attack that we see. Sending work email to personal accounts, using data on insecure lines, not following corporate policies and not securing mobile devices. So these are all things that contribute to how those employees are getting compromised by their outside, by the hackers that are out there. Brian. Thanks, Jessica. Uh, I'm very passionate about this one because in all my interactions, especially in the SMB space, uh, your people are so important to the business. Uh, we do everything that we can to try to make sure that they're as productive as possible, they're on task. Many times the culture is such that it's very close-knit. It's almost family. Um, and these guys are trying really hard on the front lines. But, but I just want to reiterate for everyone online, this is probably the biggest bang for the buck that you can, that you can spend. Take the time to make sure that your users are educated and understand what's happening because they don't, they're not necessarily as technological savvy as someone else who works in IT or maybe you as the business owner. Um, but, but, and they are, they are the, they are the spot that's being, um, that's being targeted. For them, many of them are sitting there uh, doing their jobs and they're dealing with inbound email. Um, if you've ever seen one of the most recent, um, I'll call it a scam, that comes in through email, you can tell that it, it isn't the old days, right? Where it used to be very easy to pick it out. It was the Nigerian prince who was gonna transfer $250 million and the spelling was terrible and you could just tell. Today's scams that come through email are absolutely perfect they're spot on. They're using the right uh, language. It's uh, the grammar's perfect. The logos are perfect. And if somebody's sitting back there and shipping and receiving and takes inbound emails from UPS or FedEx or the USPS, and here comes one that just looks exactly alike, they have to be aware. So um, out of all the things we'll talk about today, employees are the weakest link because they're human. Um, all the technology that's in place, especially if it's layered, is doing its job. But for the biggest return on investment, spend some time, create some culture internally for, for your firms, for your companies, make sure your employees have some education on what's going on and how they can help protect um, the rest of the team and the rest of the company. So uh, this is a big one in my mind because we deal with it, it all the time, Jessica. Absolutely. 100% agree. Okay. So what do we do now? So now we're gonna start talking about um, the proactive measures that we hope that you will take back to your organization and implement. So from a high level perspective, we're gonna look at data, perimeter, access, governance, vendor, mobile, and human. So we're gonna have items that we go through for all of these that you can take back. So first let's talk about data management. Um, what first big step we would recommend is understanding what data your organization has. Um, what is it? Where is it? 
Um, is it in file servers, databases, email servers? You want to take a look at where is all of that data. Do an inventory of all of that data. Then look at your risks to that data that you have. Then you want to start planning out who should have access to that data. And then further strengthening controls around your access controls perspective from the data. How many, understand how many copies of that data exist and where are they located? So when you think about a ransomware attack, do you have that data stored in other locations that if a hacker was to encrypt that data and be holding those keys for ransom, would you be able to recover that data from another location and be able to restore it? So this data um, essentially assessment is really understanding, you know, where are those what I'd call crown jewels of the organization and how do we best have those protected? So when you look at risks, you know, does it contain PII, personally identifiable information? Does it contain any proprietary information to your organization? Um, you know, this is a really an, a, a risk assessment, you know, of the organization to understand um, if this data was wiped out tomorrow, um, you know, would our company even be able to exist? So you have to make sure that you, you really understand your data and understand what risks there are to it, and then also what controls you have in place to protect that data. Perimeter management. So from an external perimeter perspective, do you have an external DMZ, demilitarized zone set up, where you have your internet facing devices, so whether it's an email server, a web server, an FTP server, that external DMZ is really that um, zone that's set up so that if a hacker is able to compromise one of these externally facing devices, that they're not able to then just get into your full network. Do you need to have an internal DMZ set up at all to maintain confidentiality? So some organizations need to have an internal DMZ to have um, you know, a separate part of the network where um, you know, certain uh, very sensitive uh, devices are stored. So that could be a SQL server, file shares, anything that really has that um, extremely confidential information stored in there. Segregate your network. This is so very important. That ransomware attack that I spoke to earlier that we've been most recently um, helping an organization with, if they had appropriately segregated their network, they would not be in the state that they're in right now. It's so important to make sure that you have it segregated. So like I said, so that if a hacker is able to get in, they don't just have full range of your whole entire network. They can get to you know, potentially a certain segment, but if you don't have it segregated and they're, they're able to get to all pieces of the network, they are able to then essentially encrypt whatever you have out there, take down whatever you have out there, get to and access whatever you have out there, um, you know, all of those things. So make sure that you're segregating your network appropriately. Intrusion detection and intrusion prevention systems, so very important to have in place. If you don't have these in place, I would highly recommend um, getting an intrusion detection or intrusion prevention system in place. Then you wanna make sure that you have the alerts turned on. We go into organizations and, yep, we have this, uh, you know, this uh, intrusion prevention system in place, but nobody's paying attention to it. So if nobody's paying attention to it, then those um, alerts, um, you know, they're not seeing those attempts that people are trying to get in and they're not seeing those patterns and potential um, you know, attacks looming that are out there. So it's very important to make sure that you have them in place and then also that you have the alerts turned on and that they're monitored. Um, also, one thing that hackers have realized is that encrypted traffic, um, if you don't have it set to inspect encrypted traffic, encrypted traffic is just going to flow through those systems without being looked at. So the hackers have realized that they can hide malicious attempts in that encrypted traffic and if you don't have it, your uh, system set up to inspect the encrypted traffic, it's going to allow it to pass right through. So it's very important also to make sure that your intrusion detection prevention systems are inspecting encrypted traffic. 
Protection, detection, response. So protection should definitely be layered. It's not absolute by any means. Um, if a hacker wants to get into an organization, they can spend countless hours, days, months uh, trying to get into an organization. However, that layering perspective, the more layers you put in place, the more difficult it makes it for the hackers. Many hackers want a quick return on their investment, so they're not going to spend the time going through those layers. Um, rapid detection and response is very vital, if not more so than um, from a protection perspective. Um, rapid detection with the right tools can save you thousands of dollars. So you want to make sure that you have the proper protection, but you also want to make sure that you have the systems in place that are detecting and can respond to these incidents that are happening. Access management. You want to make sure that you're properly controlling access to your systems. Um, restricting administrative access wherever possible. Um, you don't want to have you know, local administrative access to your users. Um, that should absolutely be restricted. Um, you, know, you want to make sure that you're regularly reviewing your users with domain admin access, your service accounts that have any type of administrative access. You want to keep that access very controlled. Do regular reviews of access um, to make sure that the individuals with access, um, that's appropriate for their job functions. Always leverage least privilege, so only give users the access that they truly need for their job function. And wherever possible, use multi-factor authentication. So that essential second piece of authentication that's required for you to log into a system. So governance, you wanna make sure that you have the proper governance structure in place for your organization as well. Um, so that means, um, you know, from a policy procedure perspective, your information security policy and program, your acceptable use uh, agreements that we'll talk about here next, incident response plans, um, vendor management programs, risk assessments, steer IT steering committees, all of those types of things. You want to make sure you have that appropriate governance structure set up at your organization. I just had mentioned the employee acceptable use policy. So um, this is a key uh, document uh, to your organization. It outlines what is acceptable use of those computer resources that you do have. So I do recommend um, you know, making sure that your organization has an acceptable use policy in place and that all employees are required to sign it and then also re-sign it whenever any changes are made to the agreement. Vendor management, um, so very important because we do allow so many external parties access to our networks these days. So we do recommend that you have a vendor management program in place to manage these vendors that you are allowing access to your sensitive information or to your networks. Um, you should do due diligence when you select a vendor and also review those contracts before you're signing them. And then for any critical or high risk vendors to your organization, you should be doing that um, an annual due diligence review on those vendors. So password best practices, like we talked about, um, length, the longer the better. You want to have complexity built into those passwords. You want to only, you want passwords to be unique. So, you know, use them once and then don't use them again. So many times we see um, individuals using the same password across multiple platforms. And essentially then if that password gets compromised and is for sale on the dark web, hackers know that they can potentially use that password to get into other accounts you have. So use, you know, you keep your passwords unique. Don't use them across multiple platforms. Um, safekeeping, so using a password manager or wallet. And then don't share those passwords. So you don't wanna be sharing any type of credentials or any type of login information. And then like we've talked about, wherever possible, utilize multi-factor authentication. So very important right now, especially with all of your users logging on remotely, you wanna make sure that multi-factor authentication, you have that in place. 
mobile device management. So with all of our mobile devices now that we're utilizing, you want to have acceptable use agreements in place with employees. You want to make sure that authentication and encryption is required. Secure transmission is used. You want to have a process for managing these mobile devices. And employee training is so big as well too. You want to make sure that you're training your employees on how to properly protect these mobile devices that they have. Awesome. Training for employees. So like we talked about, and especially this, you know, small to mid-sized businesses, this is so very important with the amount of tax that your employees are constantly seeing coming through their emails or other types of vectors. You want to make sure that you're performing training on a regular basis. You're educating about threats and best practices, and you're phishing your employees, doing test phishing employees on, on employees, and then using those results for your education. This mm -hmm. will help so much um, with really, you know, hitting home to those employees. You know, this is what could happen if you click on this link and things like that. And I know Brian had a couple comments on this as well. Thanks, Jessica. Absolutely. So again, back to the importance of this uh, from my seat. It's an ROI discussion for everyone out there. This is um, a piece of low hanging fruit that has very high return on investment. There are firms out there that are, are very good firms that have already developed this training with a very low cost per user basis. Take advantage of those. Make it a cultural change. That's where you're going to have the impact. Also make it fun. The employees just don't want another thing that they have to do, especially when it comes to uh, training or something that takes away what they perceive is their rights or their ability to do their job. We've set, we found by far the best results um, are with firms that have done this culturally where they, they do something fun. Maybe it's something as simple as every time somebody reports uh, uh, an email that uh, that a user didn't click on to IT or to the owner that they uh, they got bonus points and maybe it works out where it's lunch for the team on a bigger on a bigger scale we've had folks do it where whoever has the most um, turn-ins gets a, a Starbucks gift card so if you do something creative to try to get the teams involved then they don't view it as a burden and then they're more willing to participate and they understand that you're all in this together. So again, very, very important, big ROI, very low cost to get involved, but, but hugely important, especially since it's the human target. Absolutely, thanks Brian. Yep. All right, data backup. So, so critical in avoiding paying ransoms, recovering from an incident, um, that ransomware mm -hmm. incident, the most, all of them that we've dealt with this year, um, had the proper data backup processes been in place, they would have been able to recover fully and have to avoid any type of paying of any ransom. So it's so very important. Um, backup every day. Mm -hmm. Keep that data off site and keep it, have a copy of your data air gapped. Um, you know, if, you know, the hackers, what they do is, is when they get the ransom or when they get the malware into your environment, um, what they want to do is, is they want to target your backups. So if your backups are all online and connected, they're going to go and encrypt those backups first because they know that you're going to go and use those backups to try to recover. So get copies of that, those backups air gapped from your network. And as long as you can um, retain, as you can afford to retain those backups, highly recommended mm -hmm. you do so. Can I jump in, Jessica? Absolutely. Quick add on this one, folks. This one would be one of the ones where it would cost you absolutely nothing to, to have either your internal IT folks, whoever handles that for you, or your partner, if you're in a relationship with an IT vendor, um, to have them absolutely verify back to you that A, all of your data is being backed up, and B, they've done test restores. Um, as Jessica alluded to earlier, th these are the crown jewels. Your data is usually about your intellectual property, and it's about what makes you or enables your business to function. This is the last stop. So this is, this is it. When, when it hits the fan, folks, you have to be able to get your data back. And there's nothing worse than when that does happen, when that day comes, and then you find out that backups have been failing, they've never tried a test restore, and there's no way to get your data back. So this one costs absolutely nothing. Have it tested, have it restored, and then document that process for when it's being done. 
So um, hugely important that everyone should be following and again with very little or no cost at all. Absolutely. All right, so right now with the COVID-19 situation that we're all facing, this is not business as usual. Um, as we come out of quarantine, there's going to be a new normal. That new normal is going to likely be what we're dealing with right now with you know, a, a significant chunk of the workforce working remotely. So historically, pandemics have come in three waves. Um, we flattened the curve, which is going to extend the time of recovery. Um, so you know, what we need to do now is prepare for this new paradigm and prepare, prepare for this uh, new normal, this new way we're all working today. So business continuity planning. So a lot of people uh, interchange business continuity planning and disaster recovery planning. Um, really business continuity planning is if you're gonna establish that basis to maintain and recover your business processes and services to your customers when you've been, um, when your operations have been disrupted unexpectedly. So it's really looking at all of your business processes across your organization, making sure that you've properly planned for how those processes are going to continue during a pandemic, during a disaster, any of those types of scenarios. Disaster recovery planning is really the technology infrastructure that is going to support your business continuity plan. So what technology infrastructure and how would we properly plan for that technology infrastructure to be able to support our business processes going forward. Pandemic planning is definitely larger in scale and duration. It's wide thread and widespread and can threaten not just limited geographical areas, but potentially every continent that's out there. That's what we're seeing today with the COVID-19. And we're seeing this in an unprecedented manner that we've never experienced um, you know, during our time. Uh, longer lasting pandemics uh, generally occur in multiple waves, um, each lasting two to three months. Uh, you know, as we're seeing too from predictions that that's likely what we're gonna see with with COVID-19 going forward. So triage pandemic planning. So what we found um, is that most organizations didn't have a very robust pandemic plan or not one that essentially um, was planned for this type of uh, pandemic. Um, you know, now isn't really the time to construct a plan, but as we come out of this and move forward, it is something all organizations should be looking at from a continuity perspective if you didn't have one in the past. Um, but right now we need a near term plan uh, to deal with the new realities we're all facing. So um, this is really an outline um, of a recommendation of essentially how do you deal with this pandemic as you're going through this and as you're making your way through this. So reevaluating your business plan and your value proposition you can conducting a current situation assessment, develop that operating plan, develop your safety strategy for how you're going to handle um, you know, employees and keeping them safe, develop your human resources plan, develop a sales and marketing plan. These are all plans that essentially have to be looked at now from a different perspective. Um, because of the pandemic and, and how you're going to continue to move your business forward during this pandemic. And developing a remote work capability strategy. This is one we're going to hop into here next. Um, this is very, very important. So when you look at a remote work capability, <clears throat> some of the things to consider is do all of your employees have a work sanctioned phone and laptop to enable them to work remotely? Um, you know, what we saw is a lot of uh, devices getting deployed in a very quick manner. So as you continue to work through this pandemic and do planning, make sure that you have the properly sanctioned phones and laptops in place to be able to allow them to work safely as well. Have you updated your work from home policy in the last 12 months? If not, I would highly recommend doing so. Have you communicated policy and expectations to all of your employees now that they're working from home? Do you have security measures in place to mitigate cyber threats for employees working remotely? So look at you, how you have deployed this remote work capability 
And do you have all those proper security controls in place? So when we talked about remote access, do you have multi-factor in place? Do you have secure VPNs um, you know, where people are connecting to? Really take a step back and look at the security of your remote workforce you've deployed. Do you have that multi-factor authentication that we talked about? VPN licenses, do you have additional ones in the event you need to issue them, um, you know, issue additional ones. Do employees have access to the corporate systems to successfully perform their job? And then do you have that training? So as Brian and I talked about, training for your employees is so critically important. So you wanna make sure that you have trained those employees on the risks that are posed to them and how they can help mitigate those risks. Here's some uh, information that you guys can utilize um, for some uh, industry reading um, and some information about out there about threats and especially specifically how it's affecting manufacturers. And that leaves us with some time for some questions. So I'll turn it over and we can go through some questions that have um, been submitted. Thanks, Jessica. We do have a couple of questions that did come in. Um, Give me one second. Um, the first is, can you briefly explain the difference between business continuity and disaster recovery um, once again, and what are some things um, that differentiate and what we should be doing from a business standpoint? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Jessica, you want that or you want me to take it? Go ahead, Brian. All right, no big deal. Jessica, we have one slide that hit on that. That's a good question. Sometimes it's, uh, it's often confused as being the same thing, but they, too, they do address two different formal functions. So um, business continuity planning, simple, simple, is critical business functions need to be prepared to react and recover from a business disruption. Um, that way it avoids minimal impact or provides minimal impact to your business. DR planning, disaster recovery, is all about rebuilding your operation or infrastructure after the disaster has passed. So many times business continuity and DR fold in together, but they are separate, separate plans that need to be executed separately depending on the scenario. One's about continuing the business, the other one is about how do we recover once the disaster's hit. Hope that helps. Yep, thanks Brian. Yeah. Um, we are running short on time, so we will respond to the couple of other questions directly to the <laughs> participants that asked them. Um, but if there are any other questions that come to mind as you work through your business continuity plans as it relates to the economic uncertainty and mm -hmm. COVID-19, please feel free to reach out to our team and we'd be more than happy to get you the answers that you desperately need in this time. Thank you all again for joining and our marketing team will be providing you again with the slides and the presentation deck shortly. Thanks Thank everyone. you. Bye-bye.